Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I work across the, the water in Copenhagen and run a lab there called the Center for Quantum Devices. And uh, this is, I know it's late, in the, you're right, you really can't see anything. Is there a place you can stand where you can see something? No, you can't see anything at all. So you know, I don't know if you've been up here, but you can't see anything. Um, this is, even though it's late in the day, and some of you have had beers, et cetera, it, it's actually a pretty technical talk. It's, a, it's about physics. And um, there will be a lot of pretty pictures, but I think that at, at a conceptual level, it, it's pretty hard stuff. And so if, if you're halfway through it and you think, this seems kind of hard for late in the day, um, that's right, it wasn't an accident because I think it's a complicated subject. But um, unfortunately, the usual style of letting people interrupt with questions isn't going to work here because I can't, well, maybe the first two rows, if you could take the responsibility of interrupting with questions if you get too confused, because I can't see anything beyond the first couple of rows. Um, and I also know that it's an audience that is itself pretty technically sophisticated. And um, so I, I think that um, I want to start from what I imagine you all know and go from there. And uh, I want to start with today's technology. And uh, this is the inside of, a, of an FPGA, a field programmable gate array, and it, and it kind of represents the state of the art from, from the point of view of an approach to information processing based on silicon and transistors and conventional electronics, the, the thing which has always plotted in Moore's law over the last 40 years. This is kind of reaching its, its, um, its end point. And it's reaching its endpoint for, for a very obvious reason, and that has to do with the size of the wires that are inside. If you look at this, air, this b scale bar on this uh, diagram, that's 120 nanometers. If, uh, that means that these wires are about uh, 20 nanometer wires. So I at some point, not only can you not get smaller, but the physics of quantum mechanics starts entering into the problem in a bad way in this case the physics of something like tunneling through an energetically forbidden barrier is something that, that happens on these length scales as, you st as the electrons start to feel like that they're inside of atoms instead of feeling like they're inside of large wires. Um, but what's interesting about this whole progression from, you know, from 1947 and the invention of the transistor all the way through today is that there are a whole bunch of features of physics I would say features that are not controversial, physics that are part of even you know, undergraduate bachelor's education in which there's essentially no disagreement about that, the correctness of, of the ideas, but which is not used. And it may be that it's not used simply because everything else was working so well and things were going along in, in, in a great mad rush of, of technological explosion uh, until you get to the point where things aren't, you know, getting any better or any faster. And then you start to go back and you realize that there were all of these things in, in the physics catalog that, that somehow never got used and, or maybe were never needed. And they're, they're a challenge to use them. I mean, that's one reason probably why they didn't get used. They're, they're not as, as easy, I should say, as the, the technology that we have today. Um, but they may be an extremely promising resource. And that's what the, the talk today is about, is about bringing in other aspects of the physical laws that govern the, the movement of electrons inside of wires uh, that, that are not used. Um, this picture should look a little bit familiar. It's probably more familiar in more polluted countries than, than Sweden and uh, Denmark. But when a droplet of gasoline or a droplet of oil lands on the surface of water, it's, it's a, a rather familiar sight to see the interference pattern of the thin film of oil on the surface of water. I, I would guess, I'm going to ask the f people in the first two rows because it's all I can see, familiar phenomenon, vi visually, you've seen it before. You might have even taken a class in which you solved the problem of which, which parts turn red and which parts turn green, and you had learned when you were in class, I didn't think you probably spent a lot of time thinking about why it happens, but you learned at least how to calculate things that would give you the correct answer. That, that metaphor is something which will pervade this talk, which is that very often in, in physical sciences we learn how to calculate things and we get the right answer without ever stopping to ask, you know, what does it really mean? So when we have the, when we want to calculate this, we say that, it, you know, in order to keep the, 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 uh, the waves adding like this so that they, so that they double the, 
uh, the amplitude in, 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 you know, in square for the intensity. Um, instead of uh, like this where they cancel out, uh, you have to be at a certain angle and that angle tells you which ones are red and which ones are blue and which ones are green. And you can set up all kinds of um, related interference patterns and it's this kind of interference pattern that we learned to understand when we wrote down uh, eventually the, the physics of light that light should behave like a wave and that the wave should show the properties of interference. In fact, we, it's kind of a definition of what it means to be a wave. A wave is something in which there's an amplitude and the amplitudes can subtract to give you zero or they can add to double, etc. Water is another example of a wave. You can, you can stick your finger in two places on the, the surface of a water uh, a pool of water and if you stick your finger here and here where I'm shining the light now, it'll send radiating waves out I I toward the edge of the um, the boundary of the pool of water. And it's not a surprise to anybody because if you've ever splashed around in water, you, you know that there will be places like, like right here. Oh, sorry. There will be places like right here where the waves from splash number one and the wave from splash number two added up to make a, an especially bright wave, sort of like when it turned green and the waves were adding up in sync. And then there'll be other places like right here where the minimum of one wave, the wave coming from one of the sources, added up with the maximum of the other wave, and it added up to give a nothing. So far, so good. I really don't think that this is a, a puzzlement, and it should be rather intuitive for that this is the way, in general, waves behave. And you can make this same kind of argument. You can figure out where they interfere destructively, shown here, or whether they interfere constructively. And you can do similar things with light. You can have two sources of light or, or a, two slits in a pattern that lets light go through in two slits. And they'll do the same thing. They'll add up to places where the light is bright in intensity and other places where the light cancels out. Now, all is fine. Here's how you solve the problem, but that doesn't matter. Um, all is fine until you recall what it was that Albert Einstein got the Nobel Prize for and what was one of his great accomplishments in 2005 was the realization that light actually is delivered in small packets called photons. And those photons are discrete objects which will impinge upon, for instance, your retina or anything that uh, absorbs light and that the energy from that light will be delivered in a single package and that without that phenomenon you wouldn't be able to see, nothing would work and the whole physics of light wouldn't, wouldn't be as we understand it. So imagine the same kind of experiment where you readily acknowledge the existence of these particles of light impinging upon the screen as photons and you imagine this is a cartoon but we'll, we'll talk about real experiments in a bit. Here's a light gun that's shining through two slits just as if it would make these two radiating patterns. Only now I've, I've accentuated the fact that light will land in the form of discrete events on the screen. So that, that the photon that lands on the screen right there will make a spot and that that's, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying anything brain bending by saying that's where it is. That's where it was when it, when it hit the screen. It had a location. Its location is clear. Its location is the position of the green spot. But if you continue to let the photons accumulate, you'll see a pattern on the screen which resembles the interference pattern of the light that propagated through the two slits and passed through two slits. So evidently, as the light was passing from, or the individual photons were passing from this source through the two slits, they were delocalized like the surface of a wave. They didn't have a location. They must have been a wave front that passed through the two slits in a, in a sense not having any particular location like a wave front doesn't have a location. But then when measured and impinging upon the screen, suddenly was localized at some point. Now you could say, well, there's a lot of photons in a kind of a spray paint of photons, but we could let them go through very slowly, one at a time, what I mean by one at a time is that you can let the, the interval between photons be sufficiently long that the, that the first one has already gotten to the screen and made a, a blip before the second one is even released. So you can really do the experiment one at a time. And you'll still see the same pattern. And, you know, you've probably seen it before, but, you know, in, in the physical sciences and in most sciences, we have this process where, where um, after enough 
times you begin to confuse familiarity with understanding. And um, I, I think probably you've heard this, you know, particle wave duality and all of this, you know, it's 100 years old. So, um, but you have to stop for a minute and say, you know, what, is it, what does it really mean? Take a crazy example, like the wave front of light that comes out from a distant star and moves through space in some radial pattern moving out from the star. Then that light, you know, comes through the millions of years of traveling as light. And then suddenly, by a process that is seemingly statistical, it lands in your eye. And that photon is at your eye. Suddenly, the information that says that the photon is not in any of the other places that it could have been in that wavefront must instantaneously be transmitted to the photons that were on the far side of that star, billions of light years away. Now you think to yourself, well, that just sounds like bullshit. I mean, it's not, you know, obviously nothing, nothing is transferred to the other side. Surely the photon that landed in my eye was on its way all the time to my eye. I mean, I might not have known where it was until it got into my eye, but surely there was one there before it got to my eye. No, that's not right. You know that's not right because the photon must have been in all of those locations or else the, the pattern wouldn't appear. And we don't have any better story to tell now than the story that I just told you. That is, if it sounds like bullshit, I'm sorry. But there's no other story. I mean, which doesn't mean it's not bullshit. It just means there is no, there's no less, less bullshit sounding story than that one. So now I want to come back to electronics and to the, the revolution that, uh, that this idea in quantum mechanics set off and bring it to the context of, of um, chips. So here's a surface of a semiconductor. This happens to be uh, gallium arsenide doesn't matter, uh, and it has a channel that's cut into it where electrons can pass with the, uh, this way or that way, and it's pretty small, and it's measured at low temperature so that, so that the measurement of the position of the electron by all of the vibrations of the lattice doesn't take place. And if you apply an external magnetic field that, uh, th that takes the role of effectively making one path longer than the other, it does the same thing as looking at different positions on, on, the, on the screen of bright, dark, bright, dark patterns, and, and what this tells you is that the electron has proceeded from top to bottom via both paths. That is, it was delocalized during its journey. It was in both places at the same time, if you want to say it that way. Uh, and the, the evidence is this so-called Aronoff-Bohm effect of the interference of an electron with itself. Now, the thing that makes electrons even more interesting, in a sense, than photons is electrons carry charge. And charge can be used, for instance, the charge on a capacitor plate can turn a transistor on or off. So imagine now that we've said that this electron is a both, you know, going both ways at the same time. So this one's going this way, this one's going this way, and we use the charge that is uh, on this side, when we say it's on this side, to turn a switch off, and when the charge is on this side, we use that charge to turn the switch on. Now we say, within this quantum mechanical picture in which the, the, the charge is in both places at the same time, that, the, that in that sense, the effect of that charge will both flip and not flip the switch at the same time. So the switch will then be in a state of left, down, right, on. And that would be all you could say. Now, if you measured that it was left, then the switch would go to the down position. But if you don't measure it, then you just have to describe it as left, down, right, up. Now that's interesting because if that switch is on, it can let other electricity flow. And that electricity could flow to the other side of the chip and turn on another transistor. And then you'd have to say that if the charge was on the left, that the switch would be down and the transistor would be uncharged. And the switch was up and the charge was, in the sorry, I said it wrong, the switch was on the right and the switch was up and the charge was, and the electron was uncharged. So, you have to keep all of those possibilities coexisting. Now, where we're going to go is that nobody's ever built one of these things before. This is all perfectly good, even you know, boringly old-fashioned statements about quantum mechanics. But it, it's never been done. I want to just say some notation, because I'll use it in, in a little bit. Um, 
you can think about like computer scientists and call these things zeros and ones, and then you can say that the, 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 the state can be in a zero and a one at the same time. You can use, in physics, we, we characterize the state of, of, of a two-level system, a system that can be in one of two states, as uh, looking like a spin vector, so we can call it up and down, same thing. And then the, the rule of quantum mechanics that we've discussed so far is this idea that things don't have a particular state until they're measured. They are in both states as possible. So we can say that this quantity, which we'll call psi, the wave function, can be in some kind of superposition of being down and up at the same time. And that's allowed within the laws of physics and something that is certainly not used in any chips that we build. The amount of up and the amount of down doesn't need to be 50-50. And so we can characterize all the possible superpositions in the following way. Let's call down something like a down arrow, and, or sorry, zero a down arrow, and one an up arrow. And then all the possible superpositions, given the constraint that they should add up to some total probability, uh, can be written as uh, any position of that vector on the surface of a sphere. So that, for instance, if it's a 50-50 mix of Zero and one, we'll call it the east direction. If it's a negative version, that's right, the amplitudes can be negative. In fact, they can even be complex. So these a and b variables can be complex numbers. And so any arrow on the surface of a sphere represents the generalization to quantum mechanics of what used to be called a binary variable or a bit. And so this thing will get the name a qubit to represent the two-level system of a binary variable now in its quantum mechanical generalization, including the possibility of complex superpositions of those two states. So you see, it's a pretty technical talk. <laughs> now, in, in computer science, this is a subject that you all know and I don't know. So, you know, when I wanted to learn about computer science, uh, I just watched a YouTube called How to Add Numbers in One Lesson, and this is about the extent of my knowledge of classical computing. However, uh, what I know is that there are combinations of, of uh, gates, like an OR gate and a NOT gate and or NAND gate, that can produce any possible set of gates. And so I wanted to talk about this universal set of gates for a classical computer out of which you can build, in principle, any possible computer. And to say that there is an analog of that in quantum computer science, which says that if you have a couple of possible gates, namely something called a unitary, that unitary, that U stands for unitary, and what it says is it's sort of the an analog of a knot. Instead of saying it goes from a zero to a one or a one to a zero, it takes you from some state to some other state of that variable. And it's more general than a knot because it, it can go to any possible angle. But what it does is it rotates you from one to another. One other gate, which is sort of, you know, like, a, like an XOR, it's the, it's the analog of an XOR, it says if this one is, uh, is uh, if this one is up, then leave the, the one it touches alone. If this one is down, then flip it. And so this thing, which, which couples two and, and, uh, and will be the the embodiment of something that we'll learn in a minute is called entanglement. But here we just say that this is a kind of a gate that if this one is up, it, it leaves it alone, and if this one is down, it, and if it's down, it flips it, are all that you need. Unitaries and these XORs are all you need in order to build a universal machine in which any possible computational function in the full quantum mechanical space can be realized. Okay, so it's a kind of a theorem for, for quantum computing. But what we've really done in thinking about this is written that the state of a computer, let's say that these numbers represent the state of every transistor. In the, in the, so this should be, you know, this should be a billion zeros long for representing the state of every transistor. And that this will go all the way down to every transistor is in the on position to every transistor in the, is in the off position. And what we've said is that the wave function of that chip must look like a superposition of all of these possible states with some mixture of ratios of all of them, which can be complex numbers. And so, if I think of this thing as n transistors, that means that there's two to the n of these objects, 
And that means that the, the description of the state of the computer is a point in a two to the n dimensional space. Now, if you think for a minute that if I had, for instance, 300 transistors, that the dimension of the space in which the point is located is more than all the, you know, every proton in the universe. Okay, so very quickly, the space in which this system lives as a point in a vector space that's two to the n dimensions becomes astronomically big. And then you say, how, how could I possibly have a computer in which there's a point that's moving in a space that has more dimensions than there are particles in the universe? And I don't have an answer for that, <laughs> except to say, uh, you know, maybe those are in other universes somewhere. A and I want you to know, I know that sounds like bullshit, but nothing that I'm saying is disagreed upon within the community. Okay, there's a, there's a, I mean, by the community, I mean physicists. Uh, you know, th this is standard stuff. It's just, you know, we use it, we write it down, and we learn to calculate where the bright spot is, and we forget what it all means. And I haven't even touched on the weird parts yet. <laughs> because, in fact, imagine we did the following experiment. Take a helium balloon and take one atom of helium. As you remember, a helium atom has two electrons circling, circle, circling a nucleus. And the two electrons are in the lowest shell. That's why it's a noble gas. And the two electrons, if you did take chemistry class or physics class, you remember that they fill the first shell. One goes in spin up and one goes in spin down. And then the first shell is filled. And then when you have to make the next element, you have to, you have to go out to the next shell. This shell is full. So take the two electrons that make up this condition. In, in fact, we don't write usually ones up and ones down, because you don't know which one is one, which and which one is the other. So you write a superposition of this one's down and this one's up, and this one's up and that one's down. And you put a minus sign in between so that they obey the laws of, of electrons, which is when you switch their place, the overall wave function has to take on a minus sign. That's a bit of a detail, although it's going to come back later. So in any case, there's a minus sign. We choose a minus sign, but you don't care. Just let's call it this with my thumbs, one's up and one's down. But you'll remember that that means one's up and one's down, or the other way. And take them and separate them a long distance, a very long distance, without disturbing their orientation, and send one some distance away and the other one another distance away, and then measure one of them. Because they're oppositely oriented, if you measure one of them, the other one will be naturally op oppositely oriented. But what's interesting about that statement is, I didn't suggest when you measured this one over here what orientation you would put your detector. I mean, maybe you would turn it sideways, or maybe you would orient it in some orientation. And no matter how you oriented it, this one would be the opposite. So somehow, the act of measuring one would connect through space instantaneously somehow and affect not just its own outcome, but the outcome of its partner. This level of unbelievableness motivated Einstein in 1935, late in his career. This is a picture of Einstein in 1935. So he was an older guy by then. And, um, uh, and yet, the paper, this Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen paper with this uh, grammatically challenged title, can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete, is these days his most cited work. If you go to Google Scholar and you type A. Einstein to see how many, how many, how many hits all the papers have, this is number one. Because of the controversy that this paper created by talking about this separation, because you remember Einstein from relativity said nothing travels faster than the speed of light and let you measure the basis of, of a spin in this direction and it gets set in the other one. And the conclusion of this paper was, one is thus led to conclude that this description of reality given by the wave function is not complete. And the paper was careful to not say wrong, because you can calculate things with it and you get the right answer. It's just that it simply must be some kind of provisional understanding that must not be the deep, penetrating truth of what's really going on, because it, you know, it's because it sounds so crazy. And um, it's very interesting what happened during this period, 1930, 
five. Uh, the same year, that was from March, the same year in July, so it didn't take Bohr very long to write a response paper with the exact same grammatically challenged title. Can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete? And to summarize Bohr's response, he said, in fact, this new view of natural philosophy, you see, Bohr understood this wasn't a statement about physics. This was a statement about everything. This was a statement about the way we think the universe is, but it's not. That when you do something somewhere, it can't have an instantaneous effect somewhere else. And, and yet, what, what Bohr, it seems correctly these days, said was that this requires a radical revision of our attitude as regards physical reality. And that was 1935. And between then and now, I mean, as you can imagine, experiment is the arbiter of whether this is true or not. Who wins the Bohr-Einstein debate is not who's a better arguer. It's how do the experiments come out? And so immediately, this is, it took a while, but this was, you know, circa 1972. 30 years after the Bohr-Einstein episode in 1935, this was reduced to an experimentally testable practice by a guy named John Bell, who said, if you set up the following experiment, you can find out whether or not those states were predetermined before they were measured, or whether or not the act of measuring this one determined the outcome of that one. And all of those experiments, right up to the present day, so here's from, uh, from a year ago, 2015, where now these two are separated by more than a kilometer in the detector. Sorry, Einstein, quantum study suggests spooky, ac spooky action at a distance is real. So every experiment that's been done between then and now has verified this idea that not only does, the, does a system not have a state until it's measured, but if it's a multi-particle system with correlations across the system, measuring one will instantaneously determine the other. And it may be that the difficulty of the intuition of understanding this, which frankly doesn't matter. I mean, if, it, if we don't have an intuition for something, that doesn't mean it's not true. That just means that, that our evolution didn't require an intuition for it in order to survive. So that's right. We don't have any intuition for this. It seems like it's wrong to us. But why should we have an intuition for how things work inside of atoms or how they work at millikelvin temperatures or how they work in photons that have been prepared in some way that, wasn't, that didn't exist until we evolved to do it? Another way of saying what I just said, I quote uh, famous American theoretical physicist Richard Feynman, quantum mechanics describes nature as absurd from the point of view of common sense, and yet it fully agrees with experiments. So I hope you can accept nature as she is, absurd. But now, when we think about information technology, we can imagine that we set a transistor here that sets electricity to go over here, or doesn't at the same time, and, and sorry, and doesn't at the same time. And that flips a switch, which turns this on, and doesn't turn it on at the same time. And, and sets the whole chip in some state of this exponential number of possible states, because every time you get to an, ex to an intersection, you have to remember that each one could or could not go in the, the following state. And then, and then you, you know, measure this one, and it suddenly sets that one, which determines what this one is across the chip. It's all consistent with the laws of quantum mechanics, and it's never been built. And that, to me, is enough of a challenge to dedicate myself to trying to do it, because it just seems really cool. But there was an added kicker that brought the attention of the world. And the added kicker is, uh, is this. In 19, uh, sorry, in 1996, uh, Peter Shore, then at Bell Laboratories, now at MIT, uh, wrote a paper that said the following in the abstract. A digital computer is generally believed to be an efficient universal computing device. That's this universal classical comp computer that I talked about. This may not be true when quantum mechanics is taken into consideration. That is, there may be problems that cannot be efficiently simulated on a computer. What this paper considers is a problem which is hard, factoring integers. Now, factoring integers doesn't seem that hard, but it is a hard mathematics problem. And uh, what Peter Shore showed in this paper was that if you had a machine that could do that thing that I talked about in the previous slide, 
um, you could solve that problem uh, very fast. So here's the problem. I think you know the problem. The problem is one that's at the heart of the RSA algorithm for, for uh, secure communication. Two numbers that multiply together to give you, two prime numbers that multiply together to give you a, a known number. So I give you the known number. You have to find the two prime numbers. I can only see the first two rows. Does anybody know what those two numbers might be? Yeah, what are they? Yeah, 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 he says, but then he, does, but then he doesn't know. Okay, yeah, five and three, okay. Okay, Mr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> two prime numbers that multiply together to give you 4,633. 23 and 21 is not correct. 41 and 113, and each of you can ask yourselves, um, uh, uh, how, do you, how do, would I have done that? How would I have figured that out? I think you're kind of, you know, it's not like you missed that day in school where they taught you how to find those, <laughs> those numbers. There isn't a good, efficient algorithm for solving that problem. And in fact, as the problem gets bigger, it gets harder much faster. So the RSA algorithm asks the question, if I give you this number, can you find these two prime numbers that multiply together to give you that number. And that is a problem which is insolvable. Of course, if I give you one of the numbers, then you know, it's instantaneous that you can divide one by the other and find the other one. But, but to find the two is insolvable. What, uh, what I mean by that is this. Oh, sorry, I'm going to skip. I put this one in here twice. Sorry about that. Here's what I mean by that. As the number of bits in gets to be uh, gets to be large, then a computer or a hundred computers, more or less however fast they are, if you take the clock speeds from 2003 when the paper was written or the clock speeds extrapolated to 2018, it doesn't matter. Once you have a thousand bit number, it takes the age of the universe to solve the problem. But depending on the clock speed going from um, a gigahertz, megahertz, even kilohertz, uh, if you have one of these quantum computers that can keep all of the parallel states alive at the same time, the problem becomes much simpler. Now, I and many others were already interested in this problem because it was a cool problem. But this is when the world lit up. When the idea that internet security could be compromised if somebody had a quantum computer um, got things going. But I want to emphasize, and I think that this is a, a really a maybe the key point for the talk, that's not the end of the story. And, and how could it be? I mean, this is such, you know, the idea of computing in, in a billion dimensional space uh, cannot be just good for factoring numbers and solving internet problems. But what's an active area of study now is exactly what problems that we need computational advances in can be addressed by using this kind of superposition. And to a large extent, it's not known. It's not known what class of problems can be accelerated by using a quantum computer. M current work, so here's from you know, May of this year, addresses some, some interesting problems. Here's one about finding um, a, 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 um, the, the, the ground state of a chemical uh, that uh, is used in uh, the production of fertilizer, which you know, is, is, is also big business. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an iron atom in the middle of some large complex, and it's, it's, it's used to, uh, in, in the production of uh, the catalysis of fertilizer. And so this was, you know, how can you find the ground state of that molecule? It's a relatively simple molecule. And how many of these qubits would you need to do it? So this is one example of a problem where you can solve it, but depending on the details of what kind of errors the qubit has, whether, whether the rotation angles for this unitary rotation makes an error of one part in a thousand, or one part in a million, or one part in a billion, you may need something like a billion qubits, or 10 million qubits, or a million qubits. Now, that sounds a, like a lot, but actually, you know, there's a billion, there's a billion qubits right here. So, I mean, there's a billion bits right here anyway, so we just have to make the version of it which respects the quantum mechanics. So I don't think that the, that the problem of step and repeat to make a billion things is the hard part, or maybe it was the hard part, but we already solved that problem. The problem is to get the quantum coherence into the system in the first place without it getting hard as we scale it up. 
So we're beginning now, these are really brand new kinds of results to begin to understand what kind of machine would we need to build. And it's very interesting that the hardware builders, like myself, are in the exact same situation a as the, the theorists who are trying to figure out what to build in parallel. I think it's a, different, it's, a, it's a different kind of field than most where we don't know exactly what it is that we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out to build a few qubits while at the same time people are trying to figure out what, what it is that we'll do with them. But it's not surprising that industry has entered into the problem. So, you know, IBM, Google, Microsoft, all the big companies are now beginning to invest, and governments also. So there was just announced this year uh, a billion euro program in the, uh, out of the European Commission to study this and other quantum technologies that take advantage of superposition, entanglement, and these other attributes. So keep in mind the timeline. This was you know, the 1930s when people were understanding that this physics was correct. The 1990s when people were realizing that certain problems could be solved with this. But it's not until now that people have begun to make hardware and begun to see the first few qubits do what they're supposed to do. And now you see this great pouring of interest into the problem. I'm going to ask somebody who has a watch on because my, uh, my battery's dead. What time is it? Okay. So a lot of interest is pouring into this problem, but I, I mean, what I'm going to report to you is that the progress is, is difficult and, um, uh, you know, pretty, pretty incremental at this point. I'll talk about two examples of technologies that are going on in my own lab, not because they're better than what's going on in other labs, but because I know about them. And uh, I'll mention some things that are going on in other people's labs, but I, but I just, I don't know about them as much. So one example was, how do you make your first qubit? Oh, I discovered something. I if I stand back here, I can see. OK, it's open for questions now. <laughs> Anybody who wants to ask questions, I can see you now as long as I stay back here. It's OK. If I stay back here, am I out of the light? Now you can't see me, right? OK, if I come back up here, you disappear and I appear. OK. So here's an example. First of all, it's an example that shows you don't need to spend very much time on graphics in order to have an influential paper. <laughs> but what this paper said in a time when it wasn't technologically possible was if you could make a box and you could put one electron in the box, like you could make a transistor, uh, like a capacitor plate that could hold one electron, then if you could connect those two capacitor plates so that they would make one big capacitor plate for some controlled period of time, that during the time that there were two electrons on a capacitor plate, they would try to do the thing that helium did, which is that they would try to go into some opposite spin orientation. And then you could separate them, and you could use that as a kind of a c control mechanism for how to do this thing where if this one stays, this one flips, and if this one doesn't stay, then this, if this one's down, then it flips the other guy. You could do that by just using the laws that made the helium atom in the first place. All you'd need to do would be to make a box that could hold one electron. And you could read it out by trying to see the orientation of that electron by putting it in contact with a ferromagnet, et cetera. They, honestly, these theorists went a little farther than, than, than was their own comfort zone about how you'd do all the rest of it. But they worked out the math of how you do this interaction to show that it was the same as that two qubit gate that you needed in order to do universal computing. So the, the idea was that the desired operations are affected by the gating of the tunnel barrier between two neighboring dots, and it would produce universal, we propose an implementation of a universal set of one and two qubit quantum gates. So, you know, no idea that it was the best thing to do, but it, it seemed doable. And it was one of the ones that I took on about 10 years ago to, to give this a try. The first thing that had to be invented was a box that would hold one electron. The way we did it was by taking gallium arsenide and putting metal on the surface of it. This is a so-called two-dimensional electron gas heterostructure of two different kinds of gallium arsenide with, with an electron system that lives at the surface, and we put metal on. And not surprisingly, if we put negative voltages on the metal, the electrons don't like to go near the negative voltages, so they stay away. This is about one micron from side to side, so it's not particularly small compared to modern technology. It's just that this is a material that is basically free from disorder. So we can make a box of electrons here and a box of electrons there, and we could measure where the electrons were. And we could then go to begin to do the helium experiment that I talked about earlier, which is to say that we could put the two electrons here, 
whose ground state would be this up, down, minus, down, up singlet configuration. We could then change the voltages on those gates, separate the two electrons, and see how long it took to have those two electrons be independent, subsequently measure them. But all we wanted to do for this experiment was to hold them apart for a while and to ask the question, how long can you hold those two electrons apart before they lose their singlet correlation, before this idea of separating them and, and then measuring them later falls apart. And the way we did that was by eventually trying to put them back in the same box. So this is a little bit more complicated, but we would prepare, separate, and measure P, S, M by taking the two electron state here, the ground state was the singlet configuration. We would separate them to uh, what was a mix of the singlet and the triplet, the parallel oriented spins, then separate them and ask, did they go back into the state or not go back into the state? And we found something very interesting when we did that. When we asked the question, do you go back into the state that you came from or not, we got an extremely surprising result, which I think will surprise you also, which is when we separated the two electrons for something like 10 nanoseconds or 20 nanoseconds, separate them, leave them there, and then try to put them back in the same box, they all went back in the same box again here. They all went back as a singlet again. But if we waited something like 50 or 60 nanoseconds, none of them went back in the box. They had turned into a triplet. But then if we waited 120 or so, they all went back in, and then not, and then yes, and then no, and then yes, and then no. And even if you look carefully, you see even the period isn't constant. It's kind of faster down here than it is over here. So there was something that was taking these two electrons and screwing with them but in a kind of a periodic way, so that they were processing one relative to the other. And it took us a long time to figure out, but the, with the rate of precession wasn't even constant in time. So something was causing this precession. It would have to be something like a magnetic field that would make a, a spin precess. But where, how could there be a magnetic field difference between the two sides on a, on a, on a few hundred nanometer separation? What kind, of, what kind of magnetic field would have a strong enough gradient over 100 nanometers that it could make this happen? Well, eventually we figured out what it was, and it was as surprising to us as it probably will be to you, which is that there's an effective magnetic field produced by the gallium and the arsenic nuclei that live inside the crystal. That is, we make these things out of gallium arsenide, but gallium and arsenic have nuclear spins. And the nuclei of those, of those atoms was causing the electrons to process around the nuclear spins. I mean, who would have thought that we had to worry about the nucleus of the atom of the semiconductor crystal that we were working with, but that was performing the measurement? So then life went on, things got more tricky, and other people, this is from a, from a different group, this happens to be from the group in, in Delft, started working with other materials. They specifically picked materials that didn't have nuclear spin. Now, interestingly, a material that everybody here is familiar with, silicon, is a material that doesn't have any nuclear spin. Well, actually, that's not quite true. Silicon 28, the predominant species of silicon, and, and germanium is the same story, is mostly, silicon 28 is, is nuclear spin zero. Great, so at least that problem won't exist. But there's this residual 4% that's silicon 29 in naturally occurring silicon, and those spins were enough to cause the problem. So when people moved to a silicon, silicon, germanium quantum dot to do these experiments later, same problem from the residual 4%. So then came a whole community of people who were interested in trying to produce 99.9999% pure silicon 28. Now you'll notice the nationality of a lot of the, of the authors of this paper. And, and these, were the, these were the communities that used to be spinning plutonium in their, in their um, centrifuges in the Soviet Union. Uh, they're now in the business of purifying silicon to make quantum computers and other applications as well. But so the, the motivation was to get rid of this decohering mechanism once we had discovered it. So, you know, you could say, is, it, is this technology or is this physics? And, you know, I don't know. But uh, in any case, each time you discover something that's measuring the spin that you want to be left unmeasured, you then have to start a whole technological approach to get rid of it. So where are we now? Well, you know, we have now rows of quantum dots. Here's 15 of them in a row, and we can move them around and gate them. And, you know, it's far from being a quantum processor, but it's a technology in which we can measure a long coherence time for these spins, and we can measure where they are by using these sensors at the top, 
and um, it becomes now a control problem to, to try to measure them. There are other technologies with, uh, this is based on a superconductor. This is from John Martinez's group. This was when John Martinez was at University of California, Santa Barbara. John Martinez now works for Google and is doing the same thing there. But here, you know, it's pretty similar to the status of what I talked about before. This is five quantum dots that are all in a row. And here it's announcing something called the threshold for fault tolerance. And what that means is if the individual errors of the qubits are sufficiently small, this rotation angle, for instance, is sufficiently small, then you can correct the error without doing any measurement. That is, remember, you're not allowed to measure, because then you determine the state and it locks it in. But you can still do error correction without doing any measurements, but you need it to be pretty good already. And so this is a paper that claims, yes, it's only five qubits, but now they're of sufficient quality that we've reached the threshold where we can correct the errors that occur using a so-called quantum error correction algorithm. It's time to wrap it up, but there's a separate subject that I want to talk about, and so I'm going to take five minutes or something like that to just, to just change subjects, which is the introduction of a new idea into physics and into quantum computing, namely topology. So I think may maybe if you had a math class or you've just, you know, been awake for your lives, um, you've, you've, you've uh, heard about this idea that, say in this case, some loop, and I don't want to call it a circle because it doesn't matter that it's a circle, can be deformed, you know, by going like that, into this figure eight design, but cannot be deformed into something that has a non-trivial topology. So we can distinguish these two from this one by the over-under routes of, of the string. And that branch of mathematics that distinguishes this shape from that shape uh, is called topology. And what is it, what's its relationship to quantum information, or what's its relationship to information processing in general? Well, I, I think you can imagine that tying a knot in something is a very good way to store information. In fact, uh, uh, you know, this was done in Mesoamerica for centuries, and these things can still be dug up, and the knots are all still there, and the encoding of how they would, uh, how they would hold information in knots lasts for a long time. The, in order to get the, the information out, you have to unthread the knot and take it out, and it's, you know, it's, it's hard to remove that information, much harder than destroying a piece of paper, for instance. So you could ask, is there an analog of this? Can we take the wave function of some quantum mechanical system and tie it in a knot in some way that that knot is hard to remove? Can we encode topology in the wave function and give it the kind of stability that a knot has? And the answer is maybe. But first, we have to invent a particle that will remember that it's been tied in a knot. And there aren't any so far, maybe. The particles that we live with are called fermions and bosons. And that's this thing that I, that I told you about electrons already, that if you switch two of them around, you need a minus sign. Those are fermions, electrons, and most of the particles that we're used to these days. If you, switch, if you take two of them and you switch them, uh, you get a minus of the wave function, which means if you switch them twice, which is the same as wrapping one around the other one, you come back to the same wave function. No memory. No memory that one particle went around another. Bosons are the other kind of particles that we live with right now. And in either case, if you surround one by the other, nothing happens. But in lower dimension, there can be particles that remember when one particle has encircled another, and in so doing, changes the wave function. It's as if they have like a string hanging down in the third dimension below them, and when you move them around each other, it tangles the strings around each other. And in a way, what we would like to try to invent would be a system of all of these particles, and they're all moving around each other, and what's coming down below is like weaving. And that the cloth that's produced from the memory of the particles going around each other is the memory of what, what computation has been done, if we could only make particles that, that do this. And so, the last bit of my talk was to talk about this. I'm a little shy on time, so I'm probably not going to spend that much time. But it is interesting that if you did see who won the Nobel Prize in physics this year and what it was for, these guys, Duncan Haldane, David Thales, and Michael Kostulitz, got the Nobel Prize for studying topological states of matter. And if that didn't make any sense to you, there's a nice description. And now you see why they're talking about flatland, because it has to be in this reduced dimensional space so that the string can hang down into three, the imaginary string can hang down into three dimensions. 
And it's interesting, if you read the citation on the, on the Nobel website, it says topological insulators, topological superconductors, topological metals are now being talked about. These are examples of areas which, over the last decade, have defined the front line of research in condensed matter physics, not least because of the hope that topological materials will be useful for a new generation of electronics and superconductors or in future quantum computers. So what's that all about? How do we compute with them? Well, that's what I wanted to end with. I think that in this, for the sake of, of uh, time, because I'm probably pretty much out of time now, aren't I? Yeah. So then I'm going to skip forward and not tell you of the long, interesting, beautiful, fantastic history of these devices, unfortunately, but instead to say that, um, that they look like this. These are wires, nanowires, made out of a single crystal of material with aluminum that has been grown on the surface. And the aluminum at low temperature superconducts. And the combination of superconductivity, the material properties of the semiconductor, which includes something called spin-orbit coupling, and an applied magnetic field, can produce a particle that theoretically has these so-called, I'll, the, I'll give you the term for it, non-abelian particle statistics, meaning they remember when you move them around each other. And so we're, we're now in this game where we're actually much more primitive than, than the rest of the qubits because we're trying to do it in this crazy topological way. This is also going on in the lab. And we hope that there are these uh, so-called Majorana zero modes, these particles that have these statistics located along this wire. And I just wanted to give you a little tour of what this thing looks like in the lab. That's what the device looks like. We use these things to measure where the Majoranas are, and they live at the boundaries of the superconductor. That's the device right there. It's connected via all of these wires that when you zoom out, uh, let me go back one. When you zoom out, uh, it looks, uh, it's connected here uh, that goes out to the edge of the chip. Here's what that chip looks like on the refrigerator on a circuit board that lives inside of a copper box. The copper box lives at the bottom of a machine that goes to 10 milli-degrees above absolute zero. So we take the entire device down. Eventually, it gets all buttoned up here, and there's a sign on the outside that says, caution, strong magnetic fields. But inside of there, that little chip is sitting at 10 milli-degrees, one hundredth of a degree above absolute zero, with these new non-abelian particles that remember when they've been wrapped around each other as possibly the basis of a future technology. Now, life is going to have to get more complicated, and the theoretical results that say how to move these things all around each other, each one of those X's is one of these topological properties. And it's all happening right now. It's all happening now that the theory is coming out and saying, if you can make these non-abelian particles, if particles can remember that they've gone around each other, here's how you can make the fabric of a computer that will remember and will be as immune to decoherence as a knot tied in a wave function. Now, that's pretty exciting if it works. To me, it feels like pure physics, but to the technologists that support it, and I have to say, Microsoft supports a huge effort in our lab uh, to do this, uh, is this idea that maybe this is going to be the answer to cloud computing. This, or the spins in the semiconductor, or the, the superconducting qubits that Google is making. All of these are interesting technologies. And I want to end with this slide, which is the response. If you haven't been browsing the NSA website lately, uh, I'll show you this page from, from the National Security Agency, which is, they are worried about the existence of these machines. I'm worried about the failure to make one of the machines. But they're worried about the non-failure. And so you can see that what they say is, uh, below we announce, this is an announcement on the NSA website, below we announce preliminary plans for transitioning to quantum resistant encryption algorithms. Algorithms that are provably immune to quantum encrypt to, to, to having a quantum computer. What's the mathematics of proving that it's not possible? It's also an open, beautiful math problem. With that, I'm going to end. I've given you a little taste of an advanced technology that... Stick around. Let's see how fast it develops. Thanks.